right, welcome everyone. In this video, we're going to be doing a 16.8 style problem. But before we even get to that, I would like you to read over this problem and see if you can identify, right? Uh, if this showed up on a final exam, would you know that this problem comes from 16.8 Stokes theorem? So again, I, I recommend pausing the, sorry, excuse me there, pausing the video trying this one out and then unpausing it and I'll explain kind of through it. But yeah, go ahead, take a second, read this problem and then we'll go over the solutions. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start now. Again, there's some key words here, right? So it talks a little bit about outward flux and normally when you just have, you know, flux of, you know, maybe some vector field F or something like this, this means that you're doing the surface integral of f dot ds, right, over some surface. However, in this case, you have the outward flux of the curl of something. So if you want the flux of the curl, that means instead of doing the surface integral of just regular old f, we're going to do the surface integral of the curl. And notice, just to throw a little, you know, hiccup in here, instead of f, I decided to use g. But still, when we look at this thing, we should identify it as a vector field, right? In particular, if I wanted to go ahead and write this in kind of my standard vector notation here, that this would be y plus 2 in the i component, and then there is no j component, and there is no k component. So a 0 and 0 there. So again, in this case, we're trying to do the flux of the curl of g. So we're trying to calculate out this surface integral here. And so now we are set up, right, for using Stokes' theorem. Stokes' theorem says that if you're trying to calculate out the flux of the curl of some vector field, or in this case, right, this surface integral here, that you can go ahead and trade that in for just a line integral, a line integral over some curve. And instead of the curl of your vector field, you just have your vector field. So in this case, it's g dot dr. All right, so that's us working through, you know, a decent number of the hiccups here. So again, our task is to calculate out the flux of the curl. So we want this thing right here. But according to Stokes' theorem, we're going to go ahead and trade that in for a line integral. So we are applying Stokes' theorem here in order to make this trade. And so the whole big thing about Stokes' theorem, right, if I want to know how to evaluate out this line integral, I have to be able to identify the boundary curve, right? I have to know where that C is, and likewise where this dr comes from. So, okay, I need to think a little bit about my surface and therefore the boundary curve. So my surface now is the top half of the ellipsoid. So maybe we have the full ellipsoid here, looks something like this. So not quite a sphere, but something that's a little bit stretched. And we only want the top half. So maybe I only want the top piece right here. So that's what the top half of the ellipsoid looks like. And we can see that if this is our surface, then it has a place right where the surface abruptly ends, a nice boundary curve. And that's just right here. So this right here is our C, our boundary curve. And so we want to know, how do I get this? Well, the top half, the ellipsoid, that's going to be, well, the top half is going to come where z is greater than or equal to 0. So if you want right where the boundary is, that's going to be where z is equal to 0. So when z is equal to 0, we're going to have the equation x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 is equal to 1. Again, really, we're plugging in 0 for z, squaring that, and we get out 0. So this is an ellipse an ellipse in the xy plane. So this is the thing that I want to parametrize. So again, I already know z is equal to zero. In order to get a parametrization, I need an x and I need a y. Then once I have that parametrization, I'm gonna go ahead and take the derivative of it, find dr, all that good stuff. Okay, so whenever you wanna parametrize a curve like this, remember when you're just over two dimensions, right? When I just have x's and y's, I'm going to think about, okay, should I let x be equal to t, should I let y be equal to t, or should I think about sines and cosines? So this is something that we originally brought up back in 13.1, so chapter 13, section 1. And so the claim is, because we have a nice closed curve here, we're going to be thinking about sines and cosines. 
So you would like sines and cosines. Usually you would let x be something with cosine. So let's go ahead and maybe propose, first of all, x is just cosine of t. We let y be something with sine. But the claim is we may need to do some adjusting, right? Especially because this is an ellipse. So let's go ahead and see. If I was to just plug this into my equation up here, is this satisfied, right? Does it satisfy the equation for all t? So let's see. x would be cosine. So I'm going to have cosine of t squared over 4 plus y. So y is sine of t squared over 9. Does this always equal 1 for all t? And the claim is no, not really, right? One thing that we do know always equals 1 is if you have cosine squared plus sine squared. This would always equal 1. But the fact that you're dividing by 4 and you're dividing by 9 right, uh, this kind of ruins that, e that equality. So we need to kind of make an adjustment. We need to put things in front of cosine and sine to hopefully get to this good result. And so again, I'm going to muster all of my chapter 13 knowledge, and I'm going to do a little bit of guessing and checking here. I'm going to try a 2 for cosine. I'm going to show you why this is a good choice. So if I put a 2 in front of the cosine for my x parameterization, notice what happens here. So we're going to have 2 cosine of t squared. And so when I square that, this 2 is going to become a 4. And we're going to have 4 divided by 4. And so this is going to give me that first result, cosine of t squared. So that's very nice. And by that same logic, hopefully you can identify in front of the sine, we're not going to put 2. We're going to put 3. Because then when you take 3 and you square it, you're going to get 9. That's going to perfectly cancel with the 9 in the denominator. And then we're going to get cosine squared plus sine squared. And we know that is always equal to 1, no matter what the t is. So the correct parameterization for this ellipse is 2 cosine t, 3 sine t. If you really know and remember things about ellipses, right, this is because the x radius for the ellipse is 2 and the y radius for this ellipse is 3. Right, so uh, 2 for the x radius, 3 for the y radius, that's why this works out. So now we have our parameterization. I guess the only thing that I should mention, if we want to go the entire ellipse, we want to go from 0 to 2 pi. All right, so there is my parameterization. That's my r of t. Now let's go ahead and start plugging this into stuff. Again, we know what our g function is, our, our, our g vector field. And so we have y plus 2, 0, 0. We're going to be dotting with dr. Oops, I forgot my integral sign over there. So dr, remember this is the derivative of r times dt. So, okay, if I take the derivative of x, I'm going to get out negative 2 sine. If I take the derivative with respect to y, I'm going to get out 3 cosine. And then if I take the derivative of z, well, 0 just goes to 0. There we go. Now I have enough room. And now remember, I'm going to be doing a t integral, so I can go ahead and set up my bounds. Again, t ranges from 0 to 2 pi in order to go around once. And we should be a little bit upset that I have this y here, right? I need all t's. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to do two things in one here. I'm going to go ahead and apply this dot product, and I'm going to switch out. Instead of a y here, I'm going to put 3 sine t. So this is going to be 3 sine t plus 2 times negative 2 sine t. And then plus 0 times anything, plus 0 times anything. That's just, just going to be a bunch of zeros. And so here is the thing that I want to evaluate out. Let's go ahead and distribute. So I'm going to have from 0 to 2 pi, and we're going to have negative 6 sine squared t minus 4 sine t. And again, I'm evaluating from 0 to 2 pi. Now we need to go ahead and evaluate out this integral. Remember, whenever you have a sine squared or a cosine squared, in order to evaluate out this integral, we need to use the power reduction formula. So this is something that's given on our formula sheet here. So let's see, 0 to 2 pi, we're going to have the negative 6. And instead of the sine squared, I'm going to go ahead and put 1 half. And this is 1 minus cosine of 2t, as it's written on our formula sheet. 
and then minus 4 sine of t dt. And so now we can go ahead and distribute stuff a little bit. So I'm going to have, let's see, negative 0 to 2 pi. Let's see, this 1 half and the negative 6 will make negative 3. And let's go ahead and distribute that negative 3 to each piece. So I'm going to have negative 3 and then plus 3 cosine of 2t. And then minus the 4 sine of t. Now let's go ahead and integrate. So we're going to have negative 3t. Uh, let's see, when I integrate cosine, I should get out sine. And now just double checking if I was to take the derivative, right, I need to get to 3 cosine of 2t. Well, sine would go to cosine, that's good. And then when I multiply by the derivative of the inside, I'm going to get 2. But I have a 3 here. So I'm going to go ahead and do 3 halves in front. Now double check, and yes, this works out. And then finally, when I integrate, well, negative sine, I think this should go to plus cosine. We go ahead, double check. If you go ahead and uh, take the derivative of that, do you get back to where you start? Yes. All right. Now we go from 0 to 2 pi. So let's see. We're going to have negative uh, 3 times 2 pi. So that's going to be negative 6 pi. Plus, if you were to plug in 2 pi in for sine, well, technically multiply that by 2. You're plugging in 4 pi for sine. You still get out 0. And then if you plug in 2 pi in for cosine, you're going to get out 1. So that's going to be plus 4. Now plug in 0 everywhere. So if you plug in 0 for t over here, you'll get 0. If you plug in 0 for sine, you'll get 0. And if you plug in 0 for cosine, you'll get 1. So times 4, though. So this plus 4 and this minus 4 will perfectly cancel out. And your final result is going to be negative 6 pi. And so again, our final answer here, negative 6 pi. This is the flux of the curl of our vector field G over the top half of the ellipsoid. So again, it didn't say that we had to use Stokes' theorem. This is just one option, and the claim is, yeah, it was nice, right? Instead of this complicated surface integral, we had a nicer line integral. Still not the nicest thing in the world, but the claim is it would be better than the surface integral. All right, well, that's all it is. That's all there is to this problem. I have one more Stokes' theorem problem for you coming up next. I'll see you then.